Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Protantex with Noam Broussard. I'm going to talk today about silent data corruption. Noam, what is silent data corruption and why now? Why is it so important? Well, uh, silent data corruptions are errors that happen at the hardware level which are not detected by hardware detection mechanisms. The implication of that is that they will continue to exist and propagate through a system continually creating damage potentially until detected. Uh, the SDCs were always, they always existed. The problems that are happening nowadays are becoming more pronounced is first of all, we're talking about applications that are based on masses amount of electronics. So if you have an SDC uh, once in, so let's talk in DPPM, defective parts per million, if you have very, even a very small DPPM that will turn into uh, SDC, then now we're talking about orders of magnitudes of more electronics, which will make it more pronounced. The second thing are the applications themselves. So if you're talking about uh, large learning models of training on big models in general, then the identification of an error is not that straightforward. Uh, it might take many, many iterations until there is, you notice probably at an application or software level that something is not right here and since the hardware didn't identify it. And by then the damage is already done. And these are notoriously hard to find too, right? Because it's not just one thing that goes wrong. It's a sequence of things that can cause it. True. It's a sequence of things. It's, it's, a, it's a confluence of many factors. We're talking about very small geometries where, which start off already more susceptible to these kind of errors. But it's also what you do with the software upon that and uh, what the applications that run on them do. And note also that the applications that are running nowadays uh, will not necessarily be the same applications or the same intensity of applications running on that same electronics in a year or two from now. Many times SECs happen because the area where the SEC breaks out is an area that hasn't been tested sufficiently. The workload that actually triggers the SEC is very hard to test. Therefore, uh, conventional methods like ATPG or even functional testing sometimes lack. You can't really, you know, you want to get your chips out faster to the market. Not, you don't have a, a lot of time to test like you would have to make sure that you're totally clean from, from this kind of a, from error. Well, let's take a closer look. Okay. Noam, what are we looking at? Uh, so just to illustrate what I explained previously uh, a little more visually, if we have an error in a chip, which is embedded in a very large system, then the first thing is we, the error goes undetected by definition of SDC. We don't know why it happened necessarily, otherwise we'd have probably weeded it out uh, previous to this. Uh, we don't know when it actually happens. That's the problem. You don't detect it. It keeps on trickling and propagating through the system. And we don't know where exactly. So eventually when this thing is identified, it's very hard to backtrack and say that was the chip that caused everything. It's uh, many hops away. What you see here is just a trickle effect. You can imagine this is a, a large cloud, many, many different pods that are you know, running some kind of a learn, uh, distributed learning algorithm. But the point is that the damage from this one chip may trickle out to larger systems. And one of the things about silent data corruption is that you may have an error uh, based upon you have multiple processing elements, all the signals don't get through at the right time, so suddenly you miss a beat here that you didn't expect to, to miss as you went along in your design. This becomes very difficult to track down, right? Yes, exactly. The, the, the whole point here is not just the fact that something happened, it's when you identify that something went wrong, how do you backtrack? How do you uh, resolve the issue by fixing the broken part, replacing something, maintenance? Many times you might overdo it and just, you know, you, uh, you don't want to be, you don't know where the problem is. You replace a whole rack just because you don't know where the, where the source of the problem is. And this also runs the entire initial design all the way through final test, right? And then out into the field because these things can crop up at any point. Exactly. Because SEC is so slippery, elusive, then we have to address it in many different stages of the life cycle of a product. So for starters, obviously, we want to find defects in the chip during production and system. If I, uh, we move over here, uh, we also definitely want to not stop there because as accurate as we are with all the learnings that we might find at production, we still want to monitor the product in the field because we have to have that safety net while it's running its actual mission profile. And so you're picking this up in outliers, but you're also potentially missing it in outliers too, right? 
Exactly. There's no there's no fail safe uh, for this. So you have to keep you have to complement what you're doing as for uh, outlier detection with this real time safety or health monitoring in the field. What exactly do you do in order to deal with outlier detection? So we have a method that we call smart outlier detection. It's not based on broad statistics, but actually measuring or or predicting per individual device what is expected results are. It's measurement, for instance, uh, one of the best known methods of finding an outlier is by looking at its IDQ. If you look at this picture over here, I, on the y-axis we have the measured value. Normally speaking, most methods will find an outlier by looking for an IDQ measurement which is out of the bounds, or out of these limits. In our case, we're taking a more granular approach, more personalized per chip, so we want to know per individual chip, are you, are, is the measurement of IDQ in this case uh, according to its expected value. We have uh, specialized monitors called agents embedded in the chip. They look at process, but they also look at timing, uh, at, at the, time, at the mar timing margin of uh, many, many paths. In this case, what we're going to do is look at the process monitors that we have in the chip, run an algorithm which will know after a couple of chips to predict based on these process monitors what the expected IDQ would be, and then compare it to its actual measurement. And if there's a large enough distance, we'll call that an outlier. You can see in this case all the dots over here between the two lines would normally be flagged as okay. They're not exceeding those two limits, but in our case, these two chips, the red chips, their actual measurement is far away from that regression line, meaning we've measured something significantly different than what we expected for those chips. We've proven this over and over that these are actual um, DPPMs. And this can change over time too, right? Because ships age, certain things uh, change as you go. You've got a software update. So now suddenly what used to be an, uh, good enough is now an outlier. Yeah, completely. We, there's, just a, there's a limit to how good you can go with these kind of methodologies. And like you said, a uh, chip may not be flagged as an outlier, but may be marginal enough in the field life happens. You mentioned aging, which is relatively well modeled, but there are things that are less modeled. And here comes the SDC again. You know, a latent defect can happen to the, to the chip in the field, which will eventually cause that failure, which will propagate to the system. So we, we have to complement this with uh, sufficient monitoring in the field as well. So how does that evolve in the field versus what it was? So let's move over to the field. So first of all, just to get a better, uh, broader scope, let's look at what happens today in the field. Um, again, generalizing, the old way of things would be that this such a failure, in this case SDC, would happen sometime. And at that point in time, there would be errors. And the idea behind conventional methods is to identify that failure as fast as possible, a bit error rate that exceeds a certain threshold, some kind of identification method that will identify it and then quickly as possible mitigate it, either error correction or replacement, maintenance, etc. The problem with SDC is it doesn't work so well because of what we saw previously with that propagation. Until we actually identify it, if this is where the failure happened, a lot of damage will be happening depending on what the application is, so that there is uh, increased damage until this point. Eventually, you will identify the failure, but now you have to mitigate it. And if you remember, we spoke about we don't know where it happened in the system. We don't know why. We don't. There are many questions that we don't know about what the source of the SDC is. So now comes the long and tedious and expensive uh, process of finding that where, where the source is and mitigating it. Many times uh, it'll be costly, time cost, uh, uh, money cost. But eventually, finally, when we resolve the problem, uh, very high cost and damage to the system. Yeah, when this first showed up for Google and Meta, they were looking at, what, about 18 months before they finally figured out what actually happened, right? Yes, yes. They, they published quite a few papers about the implications of what this does and what, they're, what efforts they're putting in to not have this happen in their systems. This is basically electronic detective work, right? That's really what you're going for. And it, it's a very long, complicated process because it doesn't happen every time. It's a sequence. And you have to basically now hit all these corner cases and figure out which is the one that caused the problem. Exactly. Uh, it's exactly what you said. It's a detective work. And at, once you find the culprit to the problem, the next time around it might be some other reason. And therefore, our approach is not to look for the specific cause of the problem, but we're looking at the lowest 
uh, common denominator for all these problems. It's the highest uh, indicative physical phenomena which will flag such an, an issue. And even worse, if you had tested for this when it first came out and when you first produced this chip, it might have been fine. Whereas later on, you might have a problem. So now you have to go back and redo everything that you thought was okay. Yeah. Uh, life, like I said, will happen. It's not just aging. It's uh, the workloads. We mentioned this also that will be run on this device three years down the road. Are, you know, think about what we ran three years down, uh, before on, in our data centers. It's nothing compared to what we're running today. And then again, the, the software, the workload will trigger different elements in the chip at different uh, stress levels which may cause the uh, trigger of an FPC. So we have to have that net, that uh, wide net looking at all the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the common denominator, at the lowest level that uh, will indicate an FPC. So what's the solution here? Because you're never going to solve all these problems and you're never n going to know exactly what's going to happen, but you do want to build resilience into this system somehow. Right, so what, what, we, what we do, we pan down over here. So first of all, the idea is uh, at the new that we want to identify what we call a degrading fault before it actually turns into a failure. That's the crux of the issue. How do we find them before they turn into that failure and then and that henceforth, avoid this long tail of uh, discovery and resolution. So uh, if, if we can do that, then at that point where it would have failed, there will not be a failure. We can mitigate it one way or another or just run maintenance ahead of time. Uh, and the way that we do that is basically we're looking in this chip at the uh, margin to timing failure of millions of paths. The reason is this is a great precursor to many failure modes in a chip. So aging will be reflected in a reduction in timing margin. Uh, latent defects will be reflected in reduction of timing margin. Many different failure modes. That way, if we're looking at a wide enough or big enough coverage of these timing margins, we're very likely to find that reduction for whatever reason. The point is that we have that net to catch it. So if you look down here on the, on the left at how, you can see the measurement of timing margin. I just put one line, but you can imagine we're looking at many, many lines that reflect the lowest timing margin of millions of paths in a chip. And it will change over time. For instance, if I have a more stressful workload running over here, it goes down a bit, which is normal. Uh, it'll come back up, maybe not to the same level because perhaps there was some aging going on. The point of this is to see this, but also see when there's a severe drop below some critical level, which cannot be explained by any of the things that we've modeled, aging, work workloads that we tested against, as opposed to new workloads that are st more stressful, at that point we wanna raise a flag. We have actually a couple of thresholds. One of them would be FYI, know that this system is exhibiting more risky uh, margins. And the other one would be take care of it right now. This is uh, imminent uh, failure. What you're really looking at here is dependencies because if you're if one thing is supposed to depend on something else to get to the next stage, and that is slightly off, your dependency is going to be affected, and that's really where you come out with your silent data corruption, right? Right, so the, the idea really is that, that wide net so that those dependencies we track no matter where. We don't want to track a, a hop by hop. We want to look at the, the widest uh, coverage that we can of the physical element, will, which will indicate something is failing. Noam Broussard, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.